Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm going to talk about efficient learning of extensive observables of quantum states. This is joint work with uh, Camille Rosé from the Technical University in Munich. And although this work is currently not available on the archive uh, at the time of the recording, it should be available when the TQC conference starts. So this is a talk about learning properties of quantum states or tomography. And the setting is as follows. So as usual in tomography, we're given access to copies of un, some unknown quantum state rho on n qubits. So this state, of course, lives in the d to the n dimensional space. And we are allowed to perform measurements on the states, but only on one copy at a time. So um, say apply some one or two qubit unitaries and then uh, measure the outcomes. That's all we're allowed to do. And then we gather some data. We, um, we corresponding to the outcomes of the experiment. We post-process this data, and then we want to obtain some classical prediction of what our state looks like, or we want to predict um, expectation values of observables. Say. And of course, this is a widely studied problem. And some of the relevant quantities when studying this problem is the number of copies of the state you require for your procedure. This is the sample complexity. Also, how expensive the classical post-processing is, that is after you have gathered the outcomes of the experiments, how computation expensive it is to obtain the classical description of your state. And of course, these quantities all depend very much on what the task at hand precisely is. So first of all, what if you have any assumptions on the structure of the underlying state, um, but also what you consider to be ob obtaining a good estimate of these states. And there are many different variations in the literature. And for instance, one of the strongest possible notions of obtaining a classical description or recovery is that you obtain an approximation epsilon in trace distance for some arbitrary role. So without any making assumptions on the structure of the underlying state. And then it is known that the number of samples you need actually grows exponentially with, with system size. And um, in this talk, although of course the aspect of the post-processing is uh, of course also very interesting, I'm mostly gonna ask how we can actually improve this sample complexity, making some further assumptions without focusing too much on the post-processing because of clearly if we take general states, things blow up very rapidly. Now, one very natural relaxation is to focus on physically motivated states instead of general states of n qubits. So for instance, we could focus on states that we know have a certain locality structure say are they are the Gibbs state of um, some nearest neighbor Hamiltonian on the 2D lattice, like in this example down here. And departing from this assumption, we could then make the ansatz that uh, our state is of the following form. So it is described by a Gibbs state. And we're also gonna assume we have some information about the temperature. So we, we are given some upper bound on the inverse temperature and that it will then have have this form like this. So this describes, of course, many physically motivated states with a given locality assumption. And it is known that if you want to obtain a, uh, an approximation of such a state up to a trace distance epsilon, then you actually can get away with polynomially many samples in the system size. So uh, there are many works in this direction of many body tomography, but I would say that the closest in spirit to our work is the recent by Soleil Manifar from 2021, which considered a very similar setting, although they were actually interested in learning the parameters lambda i and not the, the state itself, which is a, a slightly more difficult task. Okay, but it is also possible to relax the observables we actually care about because mo most of the physically motivated observables also have some underlying locality structure. So they could be of the form uh, sum of OI, where OI are just observables acting on L by L blocks of the system, say. And if you have observables of this form or more generally just the sum, 
of observables acting on, on subsystems, then it, you only require knowledge about the reduced density matrices of the systems these observables act on to actually estimate the expectation value of, of such observables. So these are also a very natural relaxation to make to actually not only look at general observables like you would if you had a trace distance bound, but rather more physically motivated ones. And indeed here you can also win in the sample complexity. So for instance, using the recently introduced framework for shadows or also uh, the similar uh, framework of overlapping tomography, it is possible to learn all um, L by L reduced density matrices with a number of samples that grows exponentially in system size um, in the size of the blocks, but polylogarithmically in system size. So as long as we're interested in only small patches, then we can get away with a very small number of samples. However, of course, this exponential scaling in the and the size of the subsystems we want to consider is undesirable, although impossible to avoid in general, as they also show in these works. So we are um, left with the following situation. So if we know that in some sense our, our state is well approximated by some local Gibbs state, then, and don't make any assumptions on the observables, then a number of samples that grows polynomially in system size is enough to obtain a good recovery. And if we know that the, we only want to recover k local observables and make no assumptions whatsoever on the state, then for instance with shadows, uh, this many samples are sufficient. And one natural question to ask is, can we get the best of these two results by combining their assumption? Because here we have an exponential scaling in the number of and locality of the observables, whereas here you, you don't really see that. Whereas here you have a number of samples that only grows polylogarithmically with system size, and here you have a polynomial scaling in system size. And this is exactly what we achieve in this work. But to do that, we actually also need to add a third ingredient to this mix, namely techniques from quantum optimal transport, namely a so-called transport entropy inequality, which I'm gonna to explain to you in a few minutes. But the main result of our work is that if we assume that we know that the state we're interested in has this local Gibbs state um, structure and satisfies this inequality I'm gonna explain in a second, and we only care about observables which are at most k local, then we can obtain all the expectation values of such observables with a number of samples that only grows polynomially in the locality of the underlying assumption uh, of the underlying observables and polylogarithmically in system size. Okay, so in order to uh, introduce this inequality, I mentioned before, I first have to define the so-called Lipschitz constant of an observable. And right now there are a couple of competing definitions in the literature, but I will uh, use the one by De Palma et al. Uh, because it's, it's the simplest to grasp, although others have also some advantages and we use them in our paper as well. So Lipschitz of observable uh, is defined as follows. We take an observable and we see how much the expectation value of that observable can change if we only uh, optimize over states that are the same once we trace out one site. Uh, and in some sense, this quantifies how stable an observable is to local perturbations. Because of course, uh, as these states are the same, if we trace out one site, this can only measure how, how much the, the observable can actually see this difference at one site. So just to illustrate the, the Lipschitz observable uh, constant of, of observables, um, notice uh, that if we consider the class of observables we considered before, then if we let the system size n be just proportional to L squared, the size of the blocks, so that is we have K of such blocks, it is easy to see by a triangle inequality that the operator norm will actually scale like system size over L to the minus two. However, if you look at the Lipschitz constant, then it will actually be of order square root of n. And why is that? Well, if we have two states that only 
are different, um, they are the same if we trace out one side, then this expectation value will only differ at, the, at one side where we have uh, one of these observables acting. And as they all have operator more one, this is the maximum difference that we can actually expect. So we see that if we have a very local observable, then this Lipschitz norm can be much smaller than the operator norm. And in some sense, uh, the Lipschitz norm not only captures how stable a local uh, an observable is, but also how local it is. And what is nice is that this Lipschitz constant also behaves well under local time evolutions. So as the Palmer shows in his um, original uh, article, and we also show, uh, if you take a family of, of quantum channels, that satisfies a Lee Robinson bound, then this Lipschitz constant will not blow up for small times. Um, so in a nutshell, we have that the uh, observables with solid Lipschitz constant capture well local observables. The Lipschitz uh, constant, it only grows mildly if you apply short time local evolutions. So, this clearly shows that extensive physical observables and uh, times evolu local uh, short time time evolutions thereof are well captured by observables with small Lipschitz norm. And thus, as this is very often the sort of observable we care about, we should also design specific pr uh, protocols that have this as a recovery guarantee in mind. Now, how do we actually formalize this? If you go back to, to, the, to the basics and look at one way of defining the trace distance, there is the so-called variation definition of the trace distance, which says that the trace distance between two uh, states is just the maximum difference uh, of expectation values on these states uh, with observables of norm at most one. And this motivates uh, the so-called Wasserstein distance of order one between two states, which is essentially the same, but now instead of having the Lipschitz, uh, the observables of bounded operator norm, we now optimize over all observables of bounded Lipschitz norm. So it is sent this distance measures how distinguishable two states are under Lipschitz observables. And this is exactly the quantity we want to control because again, it measures how well um, we can approximate physically motivated observables on the state, not arbitrary observables, but it is a priori not clear how to actually control this distance and ensure that it is small. And now uh, these transportation entropy inequalities I mentioned before come into play. So uh, transportation entropy inequalities are widely studied in classical uh, probability theory and optimal transport and are also now finding uh, applications in quantum. and um, and as said, sigma is said to satisfy such an inequality if for some constant alpha, this uh, Wasserstein distance of order one is actually controlled by the relative entropy between two states. And in some sense, you should think of this as a stronger version of Pinsker's inequality. So Pinsker's inequality tells us that the square root of the relative entropy always gives an upper bound of the trace distance. And this is structurally the same but we now have this extra parameter alpha and we have the Wasserstein distance between um, the two states instead of the trace distance. And uh, in the classical world, the most common application of such an inequality is to show Gaussian concentration inequalities, to show that essentially, um, if you have a Lipschitz constant, uh, if you have a Lipschitz function, then it will strongly concentrate around its mean if the underlying measure also satisfies a transportation entropy inequality. So that's a typical application. Um, variations of that are also known in the quantum case, but um, this will not be our focus in this talk. And I must say that we will be particularly interested in the case where this constant alpha, which uh, is in the underlying inequality is of either constant order or of um, one over log system size order. Because although concentration inequalities are certainly very interesting, um, what is relevant to us uh, from this inequalities is that you can actually control the, the Wasserstein distance 
by the relative entropy, which is a quantity that is much easier to work with and to control. So of course, it is now natural to ask what are states that actually satisfy such inequalities. And uh, we, this, this, is a still, uh, this is a field still in its infancy, but we already have some non-trivial examples, such as uh, any uh, states uh, in 1D, also high temperature commuting Gibbs states in any dimension. And as we show in this work, uh, outputs of shallow circuits also satisfy this. And actually, I think uh, we are comfortable conjecturing that actually all states that satisfy either some appropriate notion of decay of correlations or are high temperature Gibbs states, even uh, with algebraically decay interactions, say, um, satisfy transportation entropy inequality. This is based on um, some very beautiful work by Saito and uh, others in which they show Gaussian concentration inequalities for such Gibbs states but uh, they are, which are closely related, as I mentioned before, to such inequalities. So they are not too far away from, from having the conditions we need, but not still 100% there, but this still makes us um, comfortable to conjecture that these inequalities conditions we are imposing actually hold in a very um, high degree of generality for many body systems. Now, as I mentioned before, the nice thing for this talk about these inequalities is that it allows us to control the Wasserstein by the relative entropy. And there is one standard way of controlling the relative entropy um, when you're doing tomography, namely the maximum entropy principle. So let us just quickly go back uh, and recall that um, our goal will be to learn some many body state. And we know that it, it can be written off in, in this form over here where these EIs are known. And we also have given an upper bound on, on beta. And the, the point is again, not to learn the lambda Is as in some other recent works, but rather obtain a good approximation of the state they define. And there is this very nice identity um, that I don't know who was the first person to prove. I, uh, I, it is also present in Soleil Menifar's work. So, if you denote by E lambda to be just a vector containing the expectation values of these local observables, then you can actually show that the symmetrized sum of the corresponding relative entropies of the Gibbs states is just given by this scalar product between the parameters of the underlying Gibbs states and their expectation values, and this uh, weighted by the, the inverse temperature. And in particular, this implies that if we have that the expectation values for these EIs, um, so the op operators in the exponents of the Gibbs states are close to each other, then a simple application of Helder's inequality also shows that this relative entropy is small. In particular, if we let them to be of order apps, um, one over M, then this will be arbitrarily small, right? And note again that M is the number of of terms we have in the exponent. But it is very natural to assume or that, or to expect actually, that if we have two quantum Gibbs states whose expectation values are close, then the underlying parameters must also be close. And this is actually non-trivial to show, but if we are also in this regime, so we actually um, can also infer from closeness of the expectation value, closeness of the parameters, then you actually get a better scaling in epsilon of, of this bound. So uh, instead of getting a linear in epsilon, you get quadratic in epsilon. Okay, now how do we use these ideas to actually get um, to learn Gibbs state with very few samples? Well, um, assume that uh, we have two Gibbs states such that their relative entropy density is small. Okay, so you should think of epsilon of constant order here. Then assume further that we have that the, the Gibbs state sigma mu actually satisfies this transportation entropy inequality. From this, we can then conclude that if we have O such that the, the Lipschitz norm of O is of order square root of N, then by just applying this variational definition of the Wasserstein distance, this will be this quantity over here will be smaller than the Wasserstein 
uh, sorry, the Lipschitz constant of the observable, which is just uh, roughly speaking square root of n times the square root of the relative entropy. And then we can, uh, um, by, our, by the fact that we are assuming that the underlying states actually satisfy transportation entropy inequality. So from this, we see that the, the distance of, of these expectation values is small. So of order uh, square root of epsilon times n over L to the minus two. And this will typically be a relative error for this observable O. Now, if we did not assume a transportation entropy inequality, this would be the same bound we, uh, and only had access to Pinsker, then we actually would need that the trace distance between the two observables is of order epsilon uh, to the one half. So instead of uh, working with the assumption that the two states have a small relative entropy density, the, the relative entropy has to be of order epsilon instead. So we see that a transportation entropy inequality actually allows us to, to get away with a smaller relative entropy, uh, larger relative entropy between these two states. Okay, and we conclude that the relative, all we need to aim for to obtain good recoveries for Lipschitz observables is a small relative entropy density. And there is a recipe to, to get this, as I mentioned before, namely the maximum entropy principle, because you can show that a Gibbs state actually solves the following convex optimization problem, where this is the partition function. And these here are the expectation values of the, the Gibbs state you're actually interested in. But of course, uh, it is not, uh, it will not be the case that we know these expectation values exactly. We will always only know them up to some error epsilon due to statistical fluctuations. However, if you instead solve the problem with the approximation you obtain up to some error epsilon, you can still ensure that the, uh, the state that solves this optimization problem will satisfy that the expectation values are at most epsilon close to the true state. So with this, we can ensure that uh, the distance between the vectors with the expectation values is small. Um, and once again, with some stronger assumptions on uh, convexity properties of the partition function, you can um, also obtain that whenever this condition holds, so the expectation values are close, the parameters are also close, which will give us um, stronger recovery guarantees in our algorithm. Okay, but now this um, implies that all we need to do is to learn the expectation values of these local observables up to some constant precision epsilon, and then we can run maximum entropy and get a state with a constant, uh, with a small relative entropy density. If we then assume that all these EIs, again, the operators and the exponent of the Gibbs states are K local, then with classical shadows, we can get all these expectation values with this many samples. And actually, we don't even need to use classical shadows. We just need to obtain estimates of these quantities up to uh, a precision epsilon. But the point is that whenever we have, say, a Gibbs state on a regular lattice, then the number of the EIs is actually of order n. So this over here, and k will be just a constant, right? So this term over here will just be epsilon to the minus two times some constant times log n. So putting everything together, if we all, instead of uh, wanting to obtain all Lipschitz observables with Lipschitz norm one, we wanted r, right? Then we need this many samples to obtain a good recovery. And with respect to shadows, this is an exponential improvement because as we saw before, this R over here is in some sense, a measure of the locality of the underlying observable. But now this is a polynomial dependency in the locality of the underlying observables. Whereas in the, for, by only using shadows, we got an exponential dependency. 
And this is an exponential improvement over previous many body learning promise, uh, um, promises because now the dependency on system size is logarithmic instead of exponential. Okay, so I think there's still a lot to uncover uh, based on this work. So, but I think we are very happy to have found some applications of these quantum optimal transport techniques to um, learning quantum Gibbs states. But, and I believe that um, these quantum optimal transport methods will certainly find many other applications in the near future. Um, of course, the big question op left open by our work is, does this hold this transportation entropy inequality? Does this hold for um, a larger class of systems than what we know so far? And as I mentioned before, I think there is very strong evidence that this should be a very general phenomenon for high temperature many body states, even with long range interactions. And it would certainly be nice to establish it. This, um, moreover, it would be nice to actually obtain similar results without having to solve a max entropy problem. So um, this, although the, the class of states we, for which we do have transportation entropy inequalities only contain states for which we know that we can also approximate the partition function efficiently and thus also solve the max entropy problem efficiently, it would certainly be cleaner not to have to go through it. And classically, there are some somewhat related results that uh, achieve similar um, results without our promises without actually having to solve a max entropy problem. So that would certainly also be nice. And although I did not talk too much in detail about this, our bounds are also significantly better uh, or improved, uh, especially regarding the scaling in the error. If on top of knowing that the state satisfies a transportation entropy, we know that the covariance matrix of the underlying Gibbs states um, actually have constant condition number or logarithmic, inverse logarithmic and system size um, condition number. And although we can establish this for some classes of commuting Gibbs states, I think it would be nice to, in general, obtain better bounds on such covariance matrix. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and during the conference, be happy to take your questions.